Hello, and welcome to another session of the Science of Healing Summit. Today's guest is John Stewart Reed. John is an acoustics pioneer and a man with a mission to educate, inspire, and excite the world in the field of visible sound. His career has spanned five decades, and he is widely acknowledged as an authority in cymatics, on which he speaks at conferences in Europe and America. And today, we're going to talk about the future role of sound and music in healing. Welcome, John. Thank you, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Eileen. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Yes, it's a great pleasure to be with you as well. I'm so excited. Uh, I got to see you speak in South Africa at Ubuntu Fest in 2017. And one of the stories that you tell there, and this is kind of one of your signature stories about how you really discovered the healing power of sound in the Great Pyramid in Giza. And I wonder if you can tell people, those have never heard the story, John, because it was that incident that really made you hip to the healing power of sound, right? It was indeed. And, um, you know, it's one of those wonderful happenstance sort of happy accidents that, that can occur. And many scientists, of course, have experienced this kind of thing where something happens in their lab unexpected and it leads to a discovery. And in this particular case, um, I, it's quite a long story, but I'm going to keep it as short as I possibly can for those people who have not uh, heard this story before. So in 96, 1996, uh, my daddy and I found ourselves in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid all alone. It was just, again, one of those happy accidents, really. We hadn't planned it. Um, but I did something a little bit naughty, which I know a lot of people have done, which is to lie in the sarcophagus, this 3.7 ton uh, quartz, well, rose, rose quartz granite, actually. It's a box of granite. Uh, supposedly for the interment of the pharaoh Khufu or Cheops. Anyway, I lay in this sarcophagus and because at that time in my life I was an acoustics engineer and I was very interested in the resonance of that sarcophagus and indeed you know the chamber as a whole. So I um, made a vocal glissando and at one particular frequency, one particular pitch I should really say, uh, it felt like every cell in my body was tingling. And so I went up a little bit from this particular frequency and the, the effect disappeared. And then I brought my vocal pitch down just below that frequency and again, it disappeared. So I kind of played around with that pitch just for a minute or so. And uh, every time I reached that very particular pitch, all of my cells tingled and, and like goosebumps broke out all over my flesh, you know? So it really got my attention. So I'm gonna cut this short, very, very short to say that um, I did return to Egypt later that same year, 96, armed with a lot of acoustics instrumentation. I carried out a lot of just fairly standard acoustics uh, tests and they were all very successful and very interesting. But one of the experiments that there was not time to conduct in 96 was a cymatics experiment. And this, this was the experiment that really changed my life forever and put me on the path, the journey that I'm still on today. Because this, the idea behind this uh, 97 experiment, so I went back the next year in 97, the idea was to stretch a membrane across the open top of the sarcophagus and weight it with little bags of sand all around the perimeter. And then instead of me lying in the sarcophagus, to put a small speaker there and connect that to a, an audio oscillator so that I could play any tone basically into the sarcophagus. Then I would sprinkle sand on the membrane, which by the way, we had collected outside the pyramid because they've got lots of sand in Egypt, as you know. Uh, so we sprinkle sand on the membrane. I say we, I'm talking about the antiquities inspector and me. That's all, they were the only two people in that chamber. And then um, turned on the oscillator and watched. But let me just backtrack one little bit here because three weeks before going out to Egypt in 97, I really badly injured my lower back. And it turned out to be a great gift actually, because although I was in severe pain as I entered the pyramid, um, and then obviously other people carried in the equipment. I couldn't even carry, I could hardly carry my camera, let alone 
any equipment. But anyway, within um, 20 minutes of making sound in the chamber after having set up this experiment, all of the pain in my lower back left me. And the moment that I recognized that there was no pain, uh, you might think this is a bit strange, you know, because, but I was so focused on the experiment itself. And when I tell you um, that the experiment was just so amazing, I mean, it, what happened was that day, sprinkle sand on the membrane, tuned the, uh, turned the oscillator on and tuned it to a particular frequency. And suddenly an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph appeared in the sand right in front of our eyes. And the antiquities inspector rushed over where, from where he had been standing. And he said, how you do that? How you do that? Because he obviously he recognized as I did, you know, what this was. This was an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph suddenly appearing. Um, and obviously I, I, I had no idea because I had not expected anything like that. I'd expected at the most, I would get a series of geometric patterns that I would later analyze, you know, with acoustics, math, and so on. But to see ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, well, it was during this period, uh, I think it was the second hieroglyph where suddenly I noticed no pain in my back, when before I'd been, you know, really in severe pain. And, uh, and in that moment, Eileen, I thought, I know what this is. This I've got endorphins running in my bloodstream as a consequence of being so excited, which I was. In truth, I was very excited, as you can imagine. And uh, and so I thought, yeah, I know. When I get back out of the side of the pyramid, back to the hotel, this pain is going to come back and really hit me. But the pain never did come back. And so that's how you know I knew. Well, two things really. First of all, something kind of almost miraculous. Well, it was kind of a miracle that it happened because in the three weeks leading up to going out to Egypt, I had taken so many painkillers, so many analgesics. I'd been to a physiotherapist and so on, trying to fix this problem before I went out to Egypt, but nothing had touched the pain. And so, and then within 20 minutes, no pain at all, and it never came back. So that was one thing. But then the other, you know, was the success, the amazing success of the experiment where uh, several beautiful hieroglyphs appeared on the membrane, you know, one after the other. Um, and, and I took photographs, you know, and this was film photography, by the way, in those days. So, you know, I had to kind of pray that, that, that they would come out, that they would be developed. But they all did. All, all the photos, you know, are, are for everyone to see. And so, you know knowing that obviously it said to me ah this is a this potentially could be a new tool for science using this you know very uh, crude form of cymatic technology which is what i was using in those days uh, you simply sand on a membrane a bit like a cladney plate kind of thing for all the world but it did say that to me eileen and i thought wow this could be a new tool for science and the result of that is what you see behind you here now this beautiful cymoscope instrument, which doesn't use sand, of course, it uses water as the imprinting medium. And so now we can make any sound visible, you know, but the other aspect, of course, of this journey that I've been on is investigating how does sound heal the body uh, at the biological level. And that's really the, the most exciting thing for me to be able to share with the world. Hmm. You know, I'm so curious, did you ever determine the meaning of the hieroglyphs that appeared? Yes, I, the, the, you know, the hieroglyphs were all very well known hieroglyphs. It, it, there was nothing kind of um, obscure about them. The, the, this very first one that I'm talking about is the Jed, you know, the D-J-E-D, -E the Jed uh, pillar, which is the backbone of the god Osiris. Um, and by the way, it was not static on the membrane. It was snaking, like writhing like a snake, just like you would see uh, the vertebra, you know, the, how the vertebra of a spine has curvature, a lordosis. Th this is exactly what we were seeing on the membrane. And, uh, and then there were other hieroglyphs that are very well known, like Ra, uh, the sun god hieroglyph, which is a circle within a circle, you know, concentric circles. 
Um, and then there was the SAR loop, which is the symbol for the hieroglyph for protection and so on, all very well-known hieroglyphs. And, um, and, you know, one of the, I don't think we have time today to go into it, but the, the hypothesis, you know, as to why, how are these hieroglyphs, uh, you know, somehow embedded in the crystal matrix of the sarcophagus in this Aswan pink granite. Um, it's a fascinating story, I think, for another time, Eileen, but, but it is really, um, it's exciting, you know, to think that these hieroglyphs uh, were actually not, well, in the hypothesis, they're not embedded by the ancient Egyptians. They are naturally there. But there is a connection in the hypothesis between these naturally occurring resonances, which are hieroglyphic when they're made visible, right? And the emergence of the hieroglyphic language in ancient Egypt. Like I said, a long story and for another time. Yeah, so fascinating. And it sounds like, you know, when you're talking about the spine, um, that you got resonated into a state of integrity, right? Out from a place of being out of integrity. And then in the specially designed acoustic chamber, um, your body got put back into order, which is so amazing and wonderful. And it makes me think a little bit about um, your research with Professor Jai of Rutgers University. He's the first, the person who figured out that cells resonate, right? That cells have a song and that when uh, a cancer cell makes a terrible sound and healthy cells um, make, make beautiful songs. So can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the sort of broader implications of that research and how it kind of ties into this resonance experience in the chamber? Yeah, sure. It's another long story, but again, <laughs> I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, so first of all, you know, obviously I was fascinated to know, to learn why had my back uh, been healed apparently, you know, within 20 minutes of making sound. And these sounds, by the way, uh, initially all, were all low frequency sounds. You know, we did eventually, I did eventually go through the whole of the audio spectrum, but these very first uh, hieroglyphs that we saw, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, were all created at low frequencies. So remember that because this is, you know, important when it, when it comes to the work that I'm just about to relate. So what happened was a few years ago, Professor G of Rutgers University, um, who by the way is the father of Sayaji, some of, some of your viewers may know, Sayaji is the man behind greenmedinfo.com, which is probably the world's largest natural website, I think. Um, but anyway, so say, a, say a, sorry, uh, Professor G of Rutgers University came to our lab and we worked on um, a series of experiments concerning human blood. Many years ago, I'd had this hunch, really just an intuitive hunch that music may affect the longevity of um, of red blood cells, okay? So uh, this was very interesting to Professor G and he came and we worked together on creating a protocol for this series of experiments. So again, cutting this as short as I can, it's, it's a very simple experiment really. Um, the essence of it is simple. You take a test tube of blood, human blood, whole human blood, and decant it into two smaller test tubes. One test tube goes in a very, very quiet environment. We have a, in our lab, we have a Faraday cage, which is uh, an electromagnetically screened box, but like a small room, but it's also very, very quiet in there. It's 20 de decibels for those who, you know, know what those units mean. It's a very, very quiet room. So that um, vial of blood goes in that quiet environment for 20 minutes. The other vial of blood goes into our laboratory incubator, which is sitting in the main body of the lab. Um, and it has a small speaker in it. So we can now play music to that blood. And of course, in both cases, um, the incubators are running at normal blood temperature, okay? So again, for 20 minutes, the music is playing to that blood. And then after that, we go through a protocol which allows us to test how many red blood cells are viable uh, in those two vials. And by the way, we've tested the vials before 
you know, on red blood cell count before the experiment, and then again after the experiment. And what we found was every type of music, every genre of music that we played to the blood caused a huge increase in the number of viable red blood cells. And this was a very surprising result. You know, I had hoped that there would be some kind of an improvement, but to see the huge improvements that we, you know, that we did see using an automatic cell counter was a very big surprise. And then, you know, this we, we ran these experiments for a few days and then using all different genres of music and different tunings, by the way, 432 tuning, 440 tuning, 444 tuning, all the different tunings. Because um, a lot of people believe that 432 is a more natural tuning, of course, and so that's why we tried that and the 444. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the result showed that the, the very best results occurred not with classical music, but with popular music. And that was a surprising result. You know, I, intuitively, I, I would have, well, I did believe that classical music would actually provide the best result. And yet here, you know, any music that we played to the blood that had a pounding bass beat, throbbing bass beat, produced much better results than the, than the classical music, for example. Does the person that you drew the blood from have any bearing on it? Like, did you draw that blood from a person who listens to and enjoys popular music? Or did you draw that blood from someone who listens to and enjoys classical music? That's a good question, Eileen. Actually, the answer is that the blood um, comes from a blood bank. And the only thing that we can specify in advance, you know, when we, uh, we have to buy the blood, <laughs> but, you know, when we buy the blood, uh, we can only specify general uh, age group and whether male or female and blood type as well as possible. You know, we can actually specify blood type. And, but to, to more fully answer your question, we've actually now, after these few years have gone by, you know, we've tested many different um, blood groups and male and female, and the results are always the same or very similar, let's say, right across the, the board. The only thing that makes a difference is the, the type of music. If we choose music that has this throbbing bass beat, it always produces the best result. And this was a clue. So uh, on another occasion, Professor G uh, came back to our lab and we ran another series of experiments, this time actually using the cymoscope instrument itself. So, in, you know, in this case, instead of using simply an incubator and, and having the vial of blood, you know, placed in the incubator, in this case, we actually put the blood direct into the cymoscope instrument. And this was the accident I was referring to earlier, the happy accident. The reason we did that was simply because in the little incubator in the lab, we have a small speaker. And of course, it, you know, you, I'm sure you know that all small speakers have a limited bass, um, bass response. You know, they can't really ever produce very low frequencies. And we recognized this. So we thought, oh, well, we'll just put, um, put the blood into the cymoscope and because the cymoscope has a much lower frequency response than any small speaker, right? Uh, and then this amazing accident, happy accident occurred. What happened was when we looked at the blood in the, uh, what's called the cuvette, this fused quartz cuvette in the cymoscope. So we pour it literally into the cuvette with, a, um, with with one of these devices, <laughs> little pipette. Um, what happened was when, when the blood is seen in the cuvette, it's very, very dark. It's like a kind of, oh, like a dark maroon color, actually, if you know what that is. Um, and then as soon as we put a pure tone, a low frequency tone into the blood, the blood immediately turned bright scarlet, really bright. And not only that, because the cuvette is circular and we put a specific frequency in, it created a beautiful pattern immediately in the blood, like a cymoglyph, as we call them, a sound image, right? And the amazing thing was that when we then stopped that tone, that low frequency tone, the pattern remained in the blood, 
right? And it took about uh, 15, 20 minutes for that pattern to dissipate. And this was the, this basically was the clue, Eileen, as, you know, coming full circle as to why my back was healed in the Great Pyramid all those years ago. And it comes down to this, it comes down to oxygen. And what happens is in your circulatory system in your body, obviously the, the blood is circulated because of your heart, right? Everyone knows that. Heartbeats circulate the blood. But there's another aspect to the, what the heart is doing that is not so commonly known. And it's the fact that the heart is creating sound. These are low frequency pulses of sound. So you, you know, put your heart, put your ear against someone's chest and you hear these beautiful uh, low frequency pulses of sound, right? Well, what's happening in the bloodstream is that every time there's a heart beat, the oxygen that's already dissolved in the blood coming you know, from your normal respiratory system, that oxygen is then allowed to be uh, uptaken by the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. So it's the pressure of the heartbeat, the pressure of the sound that causes the hemoglobin to absorb this oxygen. If you stop the sound, you stop the uptake of oxygen. And this is, you know, it's fairly obvious when you think about it, because let's say someone's heart stops. You know that when a heart stops beating, the person will um, become unconscious almost immediately because the brain, your brain needs so much oxygen, okay? And yet, when you think about this, although the heart has stopped beating, in your brain, all of that blood that's in your brain is super engorged with oxygen, dissolved oxygen, and yet it's not available to the hemoglobin. Why? No pressure pulse, no sound pulse from the heart. So now you're starting to see the, this idea that the low frequency sounds that I was creating all those years ago in the King's Chamber were actually greatly enhancing the oxygen availability in my body and particularly in my lower back. So now let me just very briefly talk about what was happening for me in my lower back and why this is so important for the future of medicine, okay? What was happening was my lower back had been injured three weeks earlier, as I mentioned. Some kind of a, you know, I would bent down at an awkward angle, lifted something and severely uh, pulled a, a muscle in my lower back. Now, what happens whenever an injury in the spine occurs of that nature, your body automatically goes into a spasm. It's sometimes called a splinting cycle. And this basically means it's like your body automatically creates a splint, a way of protecting that area that you've injured until, until it can be healed, okay? It's a, it's, it's a, for all the world, it's a bit like a cramp. You know, we've all had cramps and how painful they are. And what happens in a cramp, and it's the same in this splinting cycle, is that the blood, if you have a cramp, the blood is squeezed out of the muscles that are cramping. And because the, there's now no blood in the muscles, then you get very severe pain is occur, occurs. And the tighter the cramp, the, the more pain occurs. And it's the same in a splinting cycle the splint itself causes more pain generally than the injury itself. And what had happened for me, I believe, because there's no way to prove this now after all these years, but what I believe happened, Eileen, was that in the three weeks or so uh, after the injury, the healing had largely taken place already naturally in my body, but the splinting cycle had continued. And so I was still in this deep state of spasm in my lower back when I entered the pyramid and therefore in great pain. But as soon as we brought the low frequency sound along and the oxygen that would then become available to feed those muscles and release the cramp, release the spasm rather, then the pain just <laughs> magically vanished. And that's the, the kind of, you know, the full circle uh, of that story, how I was you know, healed, it really wasn't so much of a healing, more of a therapeutic effect to create, to stop this spasm, um, but very valuable from a medical perspective, because many people have, you know, 
pain that they can't deal with without taking analgesics. And analgesics in the long run are not good for us. Okay, in the short term, not a problem. But, you know, chronic analgesic taking is not a good idea for anyone. So here, um, there are other mechanisms that we, you know, could talk about that are not involved directly in the oxygenation mechanism, but nevertheless, sound can be used as a pain mediation mechanism. And we, you know, if there's time, we could talk about that as well. Mm. Well, I'm actually very familiar with that because I've been using sound to help people with pain um, for many years now. And I've really found that it, it it opens up space. It puts the body back into integrity and it allows our breath to go to these places where we haven't been going. If you have pain somewhere, you're, you're not getting oxygen and flow into that area. And so anything that helps the body to relax and open, and that's so fascinating that the, the rhythm of the heartbeat is what causes the hemoglobin to pick up the, the electricity of the oxygen and move it along. It's, um, and I'm so fascinated by the blood in the cymoscope. So um, I, I have a cymoscope on the way that John is currently making for me and I can't wait to play with it and, and put different sounds through it. But now you've got me very intrigued and wanting to put blood in it. Um, and so I'm, why do you think that the image stayed present in blood and what are the ramifications of that as opposed to water? Well, there are huge implications for this, for this research actually, because the, the main reason is because oxygen is the, the gas that, that basically powers all of the healing, almost all of the healing mechanisms in our bodies, right? So without oxygen, we wouldn't even be alive, obviously, you know, we know that. But, but in this case, oxygen is the key to all of healing. And so when we know this, this relationship between low frequency sound and the uptake of oxygen in the bloodstream, then it becomes very, very important from a medical point of view. The other series of experiments that we are planning, I am planning right now actually to conduct, uh, or with white blood cells, because um, some research that was conducted at uh, Augusta University in the USA using a mice model, mice blood, showed that low frequency sound had massively proliferated leukocyte uh, in the blood of the mice. In other words, these are you know one of the class of white blood cells in the mice that were sent off the scale basically because of the low frequency vibrations that the mice were, were subjected to in this particular series of experiments. So this has got me very excited because the idea on the one hand that we can um, power the healing mechanisms of our body simply through low frequency sound by um, it, 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 transducers that could support people to, to better health but the other idea that we can actually cause the immune system of a person to be boosted, super boosted by low frequency sound. Well, I mean, it's, it's like a utopia, you know, to be able to um, boost the immune system without drugs. We're just talking sound here, okay? So it's, oh yeah, I mean, it's a very, very uh, important medical discovery and um, we, we, believe that it's, it's going to make a huge difference in the future of medicine eventually. It gives a whole new meaning to being all about the base, right? <laughs> all about the base, because that it that, you know, I think that a lot of people feel um, feel that way about low frequencies. You know, people you see go driving by in cars that have this throbbing base going on and and wonder about it. But I think that there is some instinct driving that uh, desire to be exposed to those frequencies. I was that's just interesting. Yeah, that's a good word that you've used there, Eileen instincts because where does this come from you know it comes from our ancestors who used the drum you know beating out a rhythm on a drum what is that if it isn't low frequencies that are and of course the long wavelengths of low frequencies deeply penetrate your body in fact very low frequencies actually go straight through your body 
But on the way through, of course, they're driving this oxygenation uh, uh, mechanism and probably also driving leukocyte proliferation as well. So it, it's no wonder that people were instinctively drawn or are still instinctively drawn to low frequency sound. Yeah, I was just having a conversation <clears throat> a few days ago with someone who was talking about how the Grateful Dead at their concerts were playing uh, extremely low frequencies in audible range through the speakers um, to, to experiment with how it affected people and inducing a state of euphoria. You know, and this was in the sort of 70s and 80s. And I think that we've known for a long time on certain levels of the power of sound to, to heal us, right? I think one of the things that I've been kind of amazed about, and I would imagine you have as well, is that how very little research has been done and how very little is really being um, implemented in any kind of large scale way, right? So what's your vision for the future, John, as far as taking the, the things that you've been learning and the colleagues that you're working with this technology, like how do you see this impacting us in the future? It's a great question, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I think it's fairly common knowledge that um, the power behind the mainstream medicine, you know, currently is the pharmaceutical industry, of course. You know, pharmaceuticals, of course, they're creating drugs that are, in many cases, extremely beneficial, extremely helpful. Um, however, uh, there are many aspects to mainstream medicine that are currently being questioned. One of the, one of the, uh, areas where this is taking, you know, coming from grassroots level is the, are the students, basically the medical students who, you know, because of all the information, even this, you know, this discussion that we're having now will get out into the world and of course will be uh, watched and heard by you know, some medical students, for example. And so I'm just talking now about in general, the, the information that's available through the internet about all different kinds of modal healing modalities, including your own wonderful healing modality, uh, biofield tuning. All of this information is starting to percolate out into the mainstream. And I I've heard from reliable sources that many medical students are now questioning the model. They're having the courage to question their, their um, teachers basically in med school. And so I think, you know, we are starting to see a gradual change. It'll probably take many years for this change to occur. Um, but I think we are beginning to see that occur, those kind of uh, changes in thinking, the paradigm is starting to shift gradually, little bit by little bit. And so, and there are many ways that, that sound can be used and music indeed can be used uh, uh, from a therapeutic viewpoint, and I'll just you know mention one or two of them right now, as you questioned about the the future, you know what I see the future in medicine, because these uh, modalities that I'm going to share with you not, right now are I believe they're unstoppable in the end. I think you know uh, they will percolate into the mainstream over a number of years. So one of them concerns the vagus nerve. Um, and the vagus nerve, as you probably know, it, it, it basically connects with virtually every organ in our body. And when it leaves the, the brain stem, the first place it goes to uh, it basically are to our two ears and it, and it connects with the tragus of the ears. You know, this little flap of tissue that covers over your auditory canal. That's where it first goes to. And that's why when you touch your tragus with your finger, it's very, very sensitive to the touch. Um, so uh, the vagus nerve is responsible, for example, uh, for if you stimulate it, it will greatly reduce any chronic inflammation um, in the body. It, it affects the cytokine balance in the body and therefore ultimately affects the chronic any chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation is something that mainstream medicine have very little uh, in, in their toolbox, as it were, you know, to help, to support. Um, whereas here, stim simply by stimulating the vagus nerve in a particular way with particular frequencies, it is possible. And I, I've seen so much research on this. It's wonderful. It's exciting. 
Uh, and it means that chronic inflammation can be largely mediated simply by sound via the tragus. In this case, it wouldn't be speaker sound. It, you wouldn't be listening to the music through speakers. You would have headphones on. And I'm not now talking about those little earbuds. I'm talking about proper headphones. And they have to be headphones with a very good low frequency response. Why? Because it turns out that the vagus nerve is optimally stimulated by very low frequencies. And I'm talking about frequencies, as you mentioned, you know, with the Grateful Dead, below 20 hertz. These are some of these frequencies are inaudible, but your vagus nerve uh, nevertheless senses them. And, and the, also, apart from chronic inflammation, uh, it helps with sexual function. It helps with, um, oh, so many, oedema, all sorts of different functions in the body are supported by, you know, stimulating the vagus nerve in this way. So that's one way. Talking about, you know, what we mentioned earlier about the, the blood oxygenation. Well, if you have a patient lying in a hospital bed, you know, prone in a bed, um, then clearly, you know, their, their heart efficiency, their respiratory efficiency may be impaired. We don't know, but, but almost certainly they need more oxygen. And this is why, of course, they're very often given oxygen masks. But now here we know that simply by applying low frequency sound through the bed into the patient, then their body will receive far more oxygen, you know, from their normal, uh, even low levels of, of, of respiration, far more oxygen than they would without this. And what I'm thinking of here, Eileen, is not a kind of drone of a sound, you know, it would be rhythmic, it would be more like the waves on the ocean rhythmic coming up through the bed, very, very low frequency, perhaps even inaudible, but the patient would feel them nevertheless through their body. And this would cause the uptake of uh, oxygen, more oxygen in their body, and therefore drive all the healing processes. Another way in a hospital setting is to give the patient music. Now, and it has to be in this case, music that they love. It's not just music that someone has chosen for them. They have to choose the music themselves. Why? Because when we experience music that we particularly love, it, it releases, it causes the release of dopamine in the bloodstream, which actually powers the immune system. If you've got, you know, dopamine is known as the kind of happy hormone, or one of the happy hormones. Um, and it powers uh, uh, production of white blood cells, for example, right? So if a patient in a hospital is given, in this case, full body immersion in music, then it means that they, they, they're going to have a more powerful immune system. And that's, of course, the whole point, isn't it? Of, of, well, one of the main points of, of uh, being in hospital is to give you that immune system so that eventually you can come out a whole and healthy human being. Well, one way to achieve this is in the future will be to use ultrasound speakers. So an ultrasound speaker positioned above the bed will uh, feed a beam of, of music down to the patient's body, shaped beam. And the beautiful thing about this is that no one sitting outside or standing outside the beam will be able to hear the music or experience the music, only the person lying in the bed there will actually experience this music. Everyone outside that area, nothing at all. So if you have an, a ward with beds, you know, side by side, each patient can have their own music um, without disturbing all of the other patients. So that's another wonderful, you know, snapshot for the future. And there are many more. I don't know how much time we have, Eileen, but there are many ways that we can uh, envision a better future for uh, hospital settings. Yeah, and those feel very inexpensive and easy to implement. I'm thinking even probably wouldn't be that hard to create a kind of roll-up pad that could just go on top of a mattress and under a sheet that would be able to generate those kinds of frequencies uh, into people's bodies. And what an elegant way to encourage the body to uptake more oxygen without having to have a tank 
and a mask. So that's brilliant. I, there's so many things out there. I recently read uh, my friend, Frank Fitzpatrick wrote a book called Amplified. And in it, he talks about, and this is something that I never knew, but when you hear it, you're like, of course that makes sense about how competitive cyclists aren't allowed to wear earbuds and listen to music when they're competing because the music has the same effect or even more so as drugs, as doping. So that actually listening to music is a kind of doping that enhances our health and performance. Wow. And, and so, right? Isn't that cool? Yeah. That so cool. in that, you know, you think about something like that, about how powerful sound and music is, and then the things that you're discussing, which seem so, so available and so doable. And, um, and so I, I look forward to us participating in a future model of healthcare where these kinds of elegant sonic solutions are at hand. Oh, me too, Eileen. You know, music therapy, uh, I think, you know, it's been around for a long, long time, you know, probably from the 1950s onwards, I think, you know, we saw music therapy coming into play. But the, the, the challenge, music therapy is wonderful, but the only little challenge with it is you have to have a therapist, you know, and there's not enough therapists, music therapists to go around. So this new term that's coming in now, by the way, music medicine is a new clinical term. And this is one of the you know, aspects that I talked about earlier, where we're starting to see a paradigm shift, where in hospital settings now, many hospital settings all over the world, music medicine is starting to be used. What is it? It's simply the patient choosing their own music and experiencing their own music without a therapist. And yet uh, in all of the studies, the music um, medicine studies, they have seen huge improvements in the uh, patient uh, healing. So this is why music medicine is becoming so important. One of the aspects that we haven't yet covered, and I, I've covered very briefly now regarding whole body immersion in music is nitric oxide production. Because if you are, um, if you're immersed in music and you can be in a hospital setting using the ultrasound speakers that I mentioned without disturbing anyone else, when you're immersed in music, what happens is the uh, paranasal sinus cavities are where the nitric oxide is produced. It's also produced in your lungs. Um, so obviously the paranasal sinus cavities are very small relative to the size of the lungs. So the kind of frequencies we're talking about to stimulate nitric oxide production in your body in the sinus cavities is about between one kilohertz and two kilohertz, depending on whether you're male or female and the size of your skull and so on. In your lungs, it's typically between 100 and 150 hertz, qu quite a low frequency, because it's obviously a much larger body of gas in your, in your lungs, right? But, you know, and many people have talked about nitric oxide production through active participation, that is humming or singing, which is true, absolutely. If you hum or you sing, yes, you will greatly enhance your nitric oxide levels. Therefore, it creates vasodilation. It means that your blood pressure is going to be lowered. It reduces edema and thrombotic events are reduced and so on. So, so many wonderful things happen when nitric oxide is produced in your body. But in this case, with music, what I don't think has generally been realized is what's called Helmholtz resonance effects in your sinus cavities and in your lungs. What this means is that if you listen to music at a good level, and I'm not talking about quiet, and I'm not talking about so loud that it's gonna be you know, uncomfortable, but something fairly loud, when you do that, your paranasal sinus cavities automatically select because of Helmholtz resonance principles, the frequencies that they are best stimulated at, naturally stimulated at, and the same occurs in your lungs. Your lungs automatically tune, if you like, to those low frequencies in the music. And therefore, just by listening, experiencing music, we are creating wonderful levels of nitric oxide in the body. I mean, how wonderful is that? You know, it's fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. And right, so that's a vasodilator and it's a muscle relaxant too, it right? It's, it's also the active thing in regards to Viagra. So I guess it also boosts your um, libido as well. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everybody would be happy with that fact 
too. So this is wonderful that there's so many um, great things that are going on and that you're learning about. I want to ask you one more question, John, and that's about your cymoscope, um, because it's a very unique instrument that you created. You know, a lot of people have getting a growing fascination in cymatics because it is such a powerful medium. I remember the first time I ever saw Hans Jenny's um, original things with cymatic images and this sort of dawning awareness for me that the sound current underlies all of creation. And once you see that, and once you grok that, you know, you can never unsee it again. So I'm just really curious, like what's been your biggest aha in playing with your cymoscope and looking at different frequencies and different combinations of frequencies? Like what's been your biggest takeaway from really studying cymatic patterns over time? Gosh, there've been so many, Eileen. <clears throat> you know, one of them obviously was that amazing moment when Professor G and I first saw um, human blood turn from dark red to bright scarlet in a moment, you know, just by adding low frequency sound. So that was, you know, one of the, peak moments basically of working with the cymoscope instrument. Um, another was, was the amazing research that, that we conducted with uh, Jack Kasowitz in Florida with dolphins, you know, how um, we were able to show the dolphins actually communicate with pictures. You know, D Jack had, um, he, he called me one day, he, he didn't really know me at this time, you know, many years ago. And, but he'd heard you know, that I was doing some interesting work with the cymoscope. And he had this idea, another one of these you know, intuitive hunches, I wonder what would happen if we put a dolphin sound into the cymoscope, okay? One of those kind of things. And, and I you know, had no idea actually that we would see anything of any interest particularly, but, but Jack's idea was really extremely interesting because he, he actually uh, tasked a dolphin to echolocate using the, you know, the visual uh, sonic sense, um, to echolocate on a range of submerged uh, objects in the water, like a plastic cube and a, a ball and a cross and a duck and various plastic objects. And then he, re he recorded the reflected sound from the um, dolphin's sound beam, if you like, he re the reflections were then picked up by a hydrophone and sent to us, you know, in the UK via an email attachment, right? <laughs> and then um, I injected those sound files one by one into the cymoscope and lo and behold, one by one, we saw those objects, the same objects that the dolphin had echolocated on appeared in the water of the cymoscope, right? And I mean, that was a, oh, that was just a magical moment. And it gets even better because then, I don't know, two or three years went by and Jack had this other great idea to have the dolphin echolocate, he thought, on a, a man's face. So he, the, this man, Jim Donahue, actually submerged himself totally in, uh, you know, under the water. And the dolphin came up, you know, swimming up to him um, and took a photo, you know, with its sonic sense, uh, echolocation sense. And Jack recorded the, the reflected sound, sent it to me, and I injected it into the cymoscope this day. And, uh, Oh my goodness, when I saw the image come up on the screen, I couldn't believe it. It was the whole of Jim, the whole of this man, you know, under the water made visible. And even if there was there were two different frames. One frame, his arm was in one position, and in the other frame, his arm was in another position, meaning that if we'd had enough um, signal from the dolphin, we would have had a moving picture of Jim in the water, right? And I mean, this was an amazing, and I, I called for Annalise, you know, my wife, to come down into the lab and see this. I said, what do you see on that picture, Annalise? And she said, it is a man. I said, yeah, you're telling me it's a man. So then I got on the phone to Jack and I said, Jack, you, you told me you were sending me a, um, you know, that you'd task the dolphin to echolocation on his face. I said, it's not a face, it's the whole of Jim. You know, and he was absolutely blown away. So that was, you know, that was another magical moment. But there have been so many, Eileen, you know, we've seen 
the images of stars, star sounds made visible. This might surprise you know a lot of uh, of your viewers because people think, well, you can't have sound in space, and of course that is true. There's, you can't have sound when there's a vacuum. But in the stars themselves, of course, the, the matter is very, very dense. And so there are huge sounds inside stars and astero seismologists, <clears throat> they simply listen to those sounds by demodulating the light of the star. And then we can put it in the cymoscope and make the star sound visible. So we can see the songs of stars, you know, I mean, it's just, it is a really wonderful instrument and, you know, almost every science can be supported by the cymoscope. So I see a, a really rosy future for this instrument in the future. Yes, that sounds fabulous. I can't wait to see what tuning forks look like <laughs> when they're when they're out of phase and when they're in phase. There's lots of things that I'm looking You're forward to. You're gonna have a lot of fun, Eileen, with it. I know yeah. you will. I'm definitely looking forward to it. All right, John, is there any last words that you'd like to share with viewers just to wrap up today? I just want to thank you, big thank you, you know, because I've been on this journey, Eileen, for, well, ever since 1997, we're talking now, you know, 25 years ago. So this has been a really wonderful opportunity for me to share just a little snapshot of some of my work, you know, with your viewers. So I, I just want to give you a very, you know, applaud you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And, um, you know, the whole idea here is to share the knowledge with, uh, with as many people as possible. So many thanks. Wonderful. All right, John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Stay well.